All right. Hello, everyone. We are going to first uh, go through, uh, as I told you, that today is going to be lecture mostly. So um, uh, hopefully you didn't have any problems with your um, lab yet, or most of you submitted, actually. Many of you submitted. And most of the people who did not submit their labs, I see that they did not read the instructions properly. So. Um, um, it's mostly C, so uh, people are asking, can we use C functions like scanf and printf to do the lab? Yes, you can. That's the thing. The first lab is just for you to organize stuff, OK? So lab two is going to be a different story. That's going to be pure C++. There is no scanf thingy in there, so that's that one. So we're going to do a quick review on what we talked about last time, then we're going to uh, uh, I'm going to kind of do a poll and I'll see um, um, how you feel about pointers and addresses and stuff in, 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 in C. Um, probably do a review, quick review over what pointers are, what I usually lecture in IPC 144 in like a rush way to go through it to remind you of what it is. And then we're going to have the introduction to dynamic memory allocation and uh, we're going to call it a day. Okay, so that's uh, what we are going to do. Um, Probably for the last time, I'm going to create a, uh, the project here. So again, empty project. I still see people are uh, uh, empty project C++ Windows console. And for this one, we're going to uh, uh, select the directory in which we want to create whatever we want to create, which is in NAA in my case. And, and select the folder. It is very important to have this checked over here, please. OK? And today, this is the third um, session that I have uh, for my sets uh, for the coding. And it's January 20th. And I create. Uh, the uh, create the solution. Question that I have: Anyone over here with Mac computers have problem creating a project using Xcode? Because uh, I see many people use it. Anyone? All right. I brought my Mac today. Hopefully, I'm not going to bring it anymore. Just wanted to show you how things work with Mac if you have a problem with it, but you don't. Good. So we have no problem with Mac either. So let's, let's uh, start. So I'm going to copy. I'm going to take the things we have done last time and, and bring it in and kind of go through it very quickly. So let me just actually open it from here to review it. So I'm just going to open these files. We're all good? I think so. <clears throat> Whichever we want to do any kind of modifications, we'll do it. In and we'll add it to the current thing. But if we don't, then we're going to just uh, uh, do a review. So we talked about what includes R. We said includes our preprocessor directives. And they, anything that you start with a hashtag, you are talking to the compiler, asking the compiler how to compile your code. So when we were talking about compilers and said that compilers work in different kind of stages, and I showed you first they, it compiles the, the file, creates the object file, then links them, and so on and so forth. This comes prior to all that. So before compiler want to compile anything, like the five stages, like each stage that we have for our files to get compiled, this happens beforehand. And why everybody's so um, as if you never you didn't sleep last night? Everybody's okay? All right, that's what I like. Okay, good. Because it was like, okay, cheer up. It's a good day. Uh, it's uh, nice and uh, we are all alive and healthy, so let's, uh, let's be happy. Anyways, 
I say, because I look at the faces and I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm having a tough crowd today. So uh, I explained it over here with two includes and I put half of the program in one file and the other half in another. We compiled it and it worked and we found out that includes are nothing but uh, copy and paste. They uh, literally copy and paste uh, a for, uh, an outsider text in your program before the compilation happens. So <clears throat> this thing happens several times because you may have uh, a header file that inside that header file you may have some other includes happening and things like that. But whatever you do, it happens in uh, uh, beforehand. So we uh, uh, then we talked about overloading and how overloading a function is possible. We can have uh, same name for the function but different sets of arguments. And we said this is one of the cheesy ways to show a polymorphism in C++. It is polymorphic because the name of the function is the same, so the action is the same, but it happens in a different way because uh, you have, what do you have? You have different types of argument, different order of type arguments, type of arguments, so you are doing essentially the same thing in a different way. At the end of the semester, we'll find out that this is type of fake polymorphism, as I call it, because the name of the function is not actually lying here, uh, from the eyes of the compiler. The name of the function at line four is line char and signed int. The name of the function in line five is line char. The name of the function in line six is line. And the name of the function in line seven is line unsigned int. Therefore, four different names. Because compiler brings, uh, C++ compilers brings the arguments into the signature of the function. Therefore, functions appear to be the same, doing the different thing. Still polymorphism. But when you look at it closely, you find a trick. It's like one of those magicians who does something and you say, wow, and then you find out what did they do. You say, oh, that's easy. That's the one, OK? After going through uh, overloading, as you see over here, oh, what did I do? What did I do? I think I did some pinning by mistake instead of closing. So we want to close this one, and we want to close this one. And the next thing we said was that if, oh, this is all good, but if the logic behind the scene is the same and you're just skipping arguments to overload something, it's always easier to create default value for arguments. And we said if you put default value for arguments when the function is being called, if the argument is not provided from right-hand side only, OK? The value you provide will replace it, and therefore it uh, looks like you have, like for line number five, it looks like it's three different overloads for the function because you can call it with both arguments, which means the default values will be ignored. You can call, call it with one argument, ignoring the right argument that is an unsigned int. It's lined with one argument. And if you, get, you can ignore both of them, and uh, the values will be used. But if the sequence of the arguments is different, like you want to skip the first one and then use the second one, that's when you have to actually overload it because uh, the sequence of the arguments are not the same. And then we came to the parts of calling specific types of overloads that kind of uh, uh, becomes ambiguous for the compiler, like things like integer, uh, so like unsigned character, and an unsigned integer. Character is an integer when they are both unsigned. So the compiler doesn't know which one you're really talking about. You, like when you are saying line with a dot, the ASCII code of dot is an unsigned integer character. And uh, when I say unsigned integer character, it's just to remind you that character is nothing but an integer. So if I put line 65 over there, the compiler doesn't know if you want to call the character one or the unsigned integer one. If that's the case, it's going to give you an ambiguous call error which brings you to either make the literal value over there be exact match to the argument, or you could have casted it. I could have actually said unsigned int 65. So it would know that what is being passed is unsigned int, and that clarifies it. Not a very good practice. If you have that close type of a thing, it's kind of iffy. It's, you're essentially opening the door for bugs. We don't want that. And last but not least, 
I think I asked you to call me Freddy because far that is difficult to pronounce. And uh, Freddy, Fred, so I could have two different aliases. You can call me Fred, Freddy, or Fardak. And we said that if you do that, you're simply adding two aliases to an already existing person. You are not creating new teachers. It's still one teacher, but with three different names. And we said we can do the exact same thing in C++, where we can actually create references, which are aliases for already existing variables and objects and things, and uh, give them new names. We gave example by creating an integer i and then put a reference r for it, then demonstrating that these are actually the same. I did not do something that I, that I would like to do now, so let me save this to the current, into the current uh, solution. I think that'll do, right? And I'm going to close it and add existing item and bring this. One of the very common mistakes in mismanaging your solution is to add a file from another directory into the, into the solution. You can do that. There is no problem. But the problem with that is that uh, when you move your solution around, the file remains in the other directory and therefore is not carried. For now, don't do that if you don't understand how to create a structural thing for it. So make everything flat. Bring all the files into your own solution. Do not add files from outside uh, directories other than the solution directory. So we're going to go back in here and click on Add. So the evidence that I showed, because the other class, and it says, how can, like, how do you, I, I question that, like, how do you know that they're not actually, like, maybe uh, C++ is kind of faking it, and they are actually two integers, but they are thinking as, that's not the case. And I, and I demonstrated that by, um, by doing something like this, and I'm going to do it very quickly over here. So what I did, I literally, I said, see out uh, unsigned address of R, and then I put a space between the two, and I displayed unsigned address of A. And the fact that running this program shows the exact same address for the two different names proves that they are, in fact, the same thing. They are not different. They are exactly in the same location of memory. They are not two different things. They are identical. We use this feature, this uh, creating aliases, um, to uh, do something nice, which is getting rid of pointers to uh, return values back from, uh, through arguments. Uh, in IPC 144, we learned that you can pass back values using addresses when you are passing the address to a function instead of the function func instead of the variable itself, and you can manipulate that value and bring it back. We call those things pointers. In here, because we are actually creating a reference, you can actually make the reference become the reference of whatever you are passing to. Therefore, ref inside set 200 over there becomes the name of any integer you are passing to it. Therefore, there is no need of, uh, there is no need for pointers. If we wanted to create this set 200 using pointers, I should say set to, say, 100. And this one is going to be integer pointer PTR. And in here, if I wanted to do that, I had to say target of PTR is set to 100. And therefore, uh, the value will be set, and the exact same call for it would be, uh, in here I'm going to say a is equal to 50, change the value, and then again say set to 100, and this time pass the address of a. So that's IPC 144 version of set 200 at line 30 being called. At line 27, it's C++ because now A is passed over there and ref becomes a reference for A, so it makes our life easier. We don't have to do address of A and target of PTR in our functions, and life becomes beautiful. 
We use that for the read function, creating a function that actually returns a Boolean for success and uh, returns the, receives a reference of a value. We try to read that reference, whatever it is, from extracted from C in, and we said that C in is a not shy object. If, uh, uh, if it cannot read a value properly, it's going to go to a failure state, and it becomes inactive. To activate it again, you should clear its error, error state by calling the clear function. Clear doesn't clear anything. It doesn't clear the buffer. It doesn't do anything. It just apologizes to C in that, hey, I know something is wrong. Just get back to work, OK? And then after that, I can tell to C in to ignore many characters or backslash and whichever comes first. So it's going to keep ignoring until it hits backslash and it eats the backslash and throws it away. Therefore, this line flushes the keyboard. And uh, success becomes false, and I can get, and I do a read. So that becomes uh, one of the good uses of reference. And that's where we stopped the last time. Any questions about what we've talked about last time? Suggestions? Objections? Are you okay? All right. Nah, the mood is not good today. We've got to do something about it. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, so let me save this. So in here, I'm going to say a.ref uh, review, reference review. Okay, and that's my reference review. So uh, I need to ask you, and I want you to be honest with me on this. This is something important I want to know before I go to the next step. Uh, it depends. If this is going to affect how I'm going to deliver the next topic. How many of you are feeling uncomfortable with pointers? When I say uncomfortable, it means you are not as, as comfortable with it with, as a regular integer. OK, how many of you are uncomfortable with pointers? OK, good. I don't, maybe you know how to work with it, but it's just when you look at it, it's like, what the heck is that? OK, all right. All right, all right. So we are going to talk about pointers. So I'm going to actually deliver the same thing that I have done with pointers with IPC 144. I'm going to go take you through it. Uh, and for this part of the thing, I want to ask you for a huge favor, which is I want you to empty your brains of any knowledge that you have with pointers. I want an empty canvas, OK? I do not want to override your knowledge. I want to start from zero. So assume that you have no idea what the pointer is and welcome any type of idea that I'm going to give you. And trust me on that, OK? So we're going to go through pointers, and we're going to see how it works. Uh, it's going to be like 10, 15 minutes of delivery just to give you an idea of what a pointer is, and then we can continue after that. So we're OK with it, right? So again, please, no knowledge of pointers. And I think I need to blank the screen to set it up, uh, because I have to see. Um, um, just a second, let me see how it's going to show the presentation. Is it at the right place or not? No, it's exactly reverse. So I need to go to slide view and primary monitor. One more time. All right. OK, and let me prepare this one too. Uh-oh. OK.
So this is ready for my. All right, so I can actually switch to that one when I'm done. Now, let's begin. All right, first of all, I apologize for the thing that I created over here. I missed something, a little thing that I have to explain. It, this is your memory, the me not brain memory, your computer memory, OK? We call it RAM, random access memory. It, the random access memory is literally series of bytes that you have, series of characters. Character bytes, potatoes, potatoes in, in C language, in C characters. When I say C, I mean C++. They're the same thing, right? In C, um, characters and bytes are identical things. There are no difference between. They call a byte a character because it's suitable to hold the ASCII code of a character. So we don't have a character in C. It's just a byte. It's a small integer. And your memory is a humongous array of integers, uh, characters, OK, bytes. And each one of these bytes obviously have an, has an index, right? So index 0, 1, 2, 3, and it goes. And how big it is, it depends on the money in your pocket, how much RAM did you put on your computer, OK? So that's the size of the memory as we have. The mistake in this diagram is that I did it to the address 124, and I forgot to actually put the 124th byte over there. So it is supposed to be another square after 124, and then it goes to 125. So use your imagination. Assume that there's, because uh, if you bring it up, the 125 is going to match 124, and it means there is nothing in there. So that's a mistake. Sorry about that. I had to fix 50 slides, so I said, the heck with it. I'm just going to explain. Assume that it is a contigu contiguous series of addresses over there. So it starts from 0 and goes to a certain number. So when you define a variable inside your C program, what happens is that the operating system, the, the, the compiler, takes a piece of memory that your program has within your own executable. So when you compile that executable that you have on your computer inside that one, it actually occupies a piece of space and tags it for you to be the name of your variable. OK? And so when, when uh, you're, you, you execute your program, that program actually goes into the memory, and therefore your integer is in memory, and then you can use it. So it's everything is within your executable program. It goes. So, and you, so it, in it, when your program is running, it sits somewhere in memory and it has an address. What is the address of the variable var now? 108. It's where it begins. And what is the length of the variable? Four bytes, right? So, so let's, we know that. OK, good. So the address of integer var over here is 108. And I can do the exact same thing with any type of variable. So if I create another a double variable and call it dvar, again, it finds a place that is suitable for, for it, and it's going to set it over there. And when it goes to RAM, it's going to have an address. Now my dvar's address is 132, and the length is 8 bytes. Any problem with that? Can you see from there? OK. So when I actually set var to a value, it, it doesn't matter how big or small it is. The entire thing will be overwritten by that value. If I put 0, everything is 0. So those four bytes will be overwritten by 0. If it's a number, whatever the number is, it's going to be overwritten, and it's going to uh, go to that piece of memory and sit over there for you to use it. And the exact same case is for the double one. Are we OK with this? Down to you, everything's clear, right? So. Now, because we want to have a remote control in C program, we need to, these are, one is holding an integer, which is essentially a, a, a values from minus something to positive something. Um, and if the values are positive, it's twice as big, but it starts from 0. Remember I showed you my fingers and I said 0 to 9 or minus 5 to positive 4? It's the same thing over there, right? So it puts it over there. And for the same thing for the double value. Well, because I want to have some kind of a remote control over these things and to know where these things are and keep track of them, we need to create a new type. 
we call that type literally pointer. So I can actually, I create a variable of type. So its job is to point to other variables. Uh, and I call this int double and pointer. So I have pointer TTR. Pointer is a type. Its job, it is an integer. Literally, you see the green thing up, the, up there? It is an integer, exactly like a variable that you have. The only difference is that it's only positive. It cannot be negative. You cannot have minus 52 as an address. So we have a type called pointer, OK? Now, in this pointer, you can put a, vari a value exactly a do like you do for an integer. So I can actually say over here, PTR is equal to 102. Exactly like an integer, you are putting a value. Remember, pointers are nothing but variables. You can simply put values in it. And I put the value 102 in there, right? But the thing is that the purpose of that 102 would be to actually to point to address 102, which is, doesn't make sense over here. Because the 102 doesn't belong to me, I need to know, I need to actually make it point to a place that I own so I don't screw things up. So it's a good idea to actually put a value to, a, like put 108 so it actually goes to the, to the variable. Problem is that, how the heck do I know where var is sitting? It is an absolute impossible thing. Can't do that. So because of that, what I would do, I would create another operator an operator, and this operator extracts the addresses of already existing variables. So I should be able to actually say something like PTR is equal to address of a variable, and therefore because var is sitting at 108, value 108 will go to the pointer. Are we okay with this? Again, please format your brains and just go with this. So I have pointer PTR, PTR is address of var. Right? Are we good? All right. So doing something like this, I can actually access the variable using the pointer. All I need to do is to say target of PTR is 235. Because target of PTR is 235, I'm not setting the PTR to anything. I am setting the target of PTR is 235. Therefore, the value is not going to overwrite PTR, but it's going to overwrite the variable instead. And the result of that would be this. Are we clear on this? Any problem with this? Are we good? All right. So if I actually print the variable, the outcome, the output of that thing would be 2, 3, 4, 5. Right? It's going to actually print the variable because I did. And, and if I print the target of PTR, the outcome again will be 2, 3, 4, 5. It doesn't make any difference. But if I print the PTR itself, then it's going to actually print the address for me, where that variable is sitting in. Are we OK? You look like a question mark. Is that OK? Is that OK? No, I'm, I'm talking. Are we OK? Yeah. Are we OK? All right. All right. So are we OK down to this point? So it's very simple and straightforward and literally English, OK? So pointers are only variables. Regular, don't give them extra credit. Don't think they do magic. It's just like they are variables whose job is to hold specific type of integer value, which is the address of some other thing. When I say address, it means the index of that thing in the memory array, <laughs> where in the memory that thing is sitting. So. If I want to do the same thing for a double, I need to say PTR is to equal to address of the double variable, correct? And therefore, 132 will go into the pointer. Are we OK with this? Are we OK with this? But the problem is here now. If I do something like this and try to actually set that value to something, how does the compiler know what is the size? We just accept that the last one is going to overwrote four, four bytes. I'm using PTR. How does it know that it has to overwrote the eight bytes? This is a bad design. It's not going to work. Because from 
this pointer, you don't, you don't know what, is, what are you pointing at. If I do like this, or right, if I do like this, you don't know if I'm pointing to the computer or the water bottle. Two completely different things. With one you program, with the other one you satisfy your thirst. Okay, so again, it didn't work. So this thing is a bad design, and we cannot do this. To be able to do something like this, I have to make the pointer that I have to point to only one type of value, so it knows what is the target. If I told you, go to the bus station, you have the address of bus station in your brain, you go, you're looking for a bus station. If I told you, go to a bus station, you follow the address and there's a newsstand over there, that doesn't make sense for you, correct? You're confused. Like if I give you, okay, come to the theater, we're gonna watch Avatar, and you follow the address, it's a library. What the heck? I was supposed to read it? I mean, you know what I mean? So it's the same thing over here. I need to mention what is the type. So I have to correct my design for, for pointer over here and actually add what am I pointing to. So I have to say integer pointer PTR. And therefore, PTR is, is responsible only for integer values and capable of keeping integer uh, uh, addresses and therefore everything happens the way it's supposed to. Now if I actually want to point to a double, what I need to do is to actually create a double pointer, let's call it DPTR. Now as you see the DPTR and PTR are exactly the same size. They are both addresses. The envelope that goes to a theater with the envelope that goes to your home is the same. The address is the same. It's the target that is different, right? So, because of this fact, uh, uh, the size of the two pointers are the same. And now when I actually make the TPTR address of the value, there is no problem setting it to a value because now it knows the target is eight bytes, it's a double. It's gonna actually overwrite it properly and everything works exactly the same way as it did for the integer one. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? So to look at this in action, what I can do over here is to actually say pointer. Oh, sorry. First, I have an integer. Integer, say, uh, what is the thing? Integer uh, A, 24. And then I can say pointer, oh, integer pointer, sorry. Integer pointer. Uh, P is set to address of A, correct? And now I can say target of P is set to 345. Now if I actually show the value of A, the outcome will be 345. You follow? Did you even know that these things existed in C language? Pointer of, address of. No? Because it doesn't. This is what I did. I hit that one. Pointers.h, you see that? Take a look. OK? So all you need, when I tell you it makes sense, if you say it right, this is what I mean. When you say target of, it's an asterisk that comes before a pointer. When you say address of, it's an ampersand that comes beside the variable to extract the address. When you say pointer, it's actually an asterisk stick to the type. To kind of get over with the confusion, what we can do is this. So we know pointer is presented by asterisk. And because of that, all the pointers that I have over here will be replaced by asterisk. Therefore, but you have to remember, the asterisk belongs to the pointer, not to the variable. It's integer pointer PTR, not integer pointer PTR. Okay, the pause is between the 
integer pointer and the variable. PTR is a variable of type integer pointer. Remember that. And we have address of as ampersand. So when you are saying address of, you have to replace the address of with an ampersand, but that ampersand belongs to DVAC. It means address of DVAC. And again, target of, unfortunately, is again presented by asterisk, which means if you want to change the target of, you have to change, if you want the target to be set properly, you should actually change the target of with asterisk, and that now actually belongs to the variable, not the type. So how do we recognize this mayhem? This is what we do. Target of and pointer are both presented by asterisk, except the fact. If that asterisk comes after a type, it's type pointer, whatever, like an integer pointer, like a double pointer, like a, an employee pointer. I put struct over there because it was back in C. In C++, when you make something a structure, structure automatically it becomes a type. So in C++, you simply say employee pointer. Okay? No difference. So employee pointer, but if asterisk comes in front of a variable, then it means target of, which A is target of P, which means P is a pointer, A is being set to the target of whatever P is pointing to. Target of T is equal to, to X, it means wherever T is pointing, it's going to be set to X, not T itself. And now I'm saying E, and now I'm saying A is equal to B, this asterisk makes sense. It's not a freaky one, so that's multiplication. So A is equal to B multiplied to target of C. And which means A is a variable, B is a variable, C is a pointer. And now E is equal to MC2. So E is equal to target of M multiplied by C multiplied by C, which means E is a variable, M is a pointer, C is a variable, C is a variable. So if asterisk makes sense, if asterisk makes sense, it's multiplication. If it doesn't make sense, you go, ah, it means it's target of. Whatever it comes after is a pointer. If you see there is a type and an asterisk, it means together they are one and it means type pointer. Remember that. And that's that. Those are pointers. That's the quick version of IPC 144 teaching of what pointer is. So now we know what pointers are. And also, we need to know something else about C language, how arrays are presented in C language. Now, when you are dealing with array, we have the good old memory. We have, when we actually create an integer, it's one variable sitting somewhere, right? But when you are, and if you have a pointer, that pointer actually points to it. We know that we just talked about it three seconds ago, right? But, and, and all the good stuff happens and settings and all the things that we have. But if you create an array, it's not one integer that is creating. It is actually five integers that is creating because I said integer A R five, correct? But that's not actually the case. The, in reality, and of course, when you set a certain index over there, it sets the index to whatever it is. So A3 is 2, 3, 4, 5. We know that. We've done this. But the reality of the thing is that when you create an integer, a, a point, uh, an array of any kind, and you say, I want five elements, it's not actually five. There's actually six of them. And don't go over null byte stuff. It's not like that. It's actually six of them, OK? The sixth one is a pointer of type constant, whatever it is. So it's a pointer. It's constant because you don't want it to point anywhere else. You want to always point to this one. And that pointer is actually pointing to the beginning of the array. And it's called AR, the name of your array. That's what it is. So essentially, an array is a pointer pointing to a chunk of memory. 
that you can access using his address. That's why indexes in start, from z start from zero in C. Because you are saying from the address kept in here, go zero types further, zero integers further. Which one is it? The first one. If you want to go to second one, you have to say pass one integer and go to next one. So you're adding the, the size of one integer to it. The first one says zero four bytes, that's the one. The other one says one four bytes, it goes over there. Two four bytes comes over here. Three four bytes come over here. And that's why we, it, we have the type, so it knows what is the size so it can jump. As a matter of fact, to prove this thing, you can literally use an array like a pointer. So if you say target of AR, it essentially means the first element. You can actually do that. It actually sets the value absolutely no, no problem. It actually works perfectly. And if you say AR2 is 444 four, four, and set the value to it, you can actually write the crazy version for it. And you can write the crazy version for it and say target of AR, the pointer, plus size of two integers is set to 555. Five, five. So these two lines are identical. This is the pointer notation of an array. No difference. Because AR is a pointer, you can treat it as a pointer. And this actually uh, overrides the other one with 555. Five, five. So that's pointer, but that's what arrays are. Arrays are nothing but a pointer pointing a chunk of stuff in your memory. And nothing else. It's literally that. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? So what I want to say over here is this. If I actually, if I actually, so I'm just going to write this over here. Uh, I'm going to call it be fake pointers. Just to remember what was that. All right, so now I'm going to come back to that program thingy that we had over here, and I don't want this pointer thingy anymore. So what I'm saying is this. So if I say over here integer a5 or a6 uh, set to, and you don't need the assignment over there anymore. Well, you can just put curly bracket and set it. The assignment is gone, OK, uh, after C++ 11, you can just put it in front of, like that's for initialization only, by the way. So now in here, for example, I said 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. So I have uh, six of them uh, from that one. Then in here, I'm going to have an integer pointer, and I'm going to set it to the address of A3, A2. So essentially, key, if I say C out target of Target of P, what is the output of line 6? Beautiful thing for a quiz. It's going to be 30 because 0, 1, 2. What's going to print is actually 3 years later if it compiles. will be 30. No problem with that, hopefully, right? We're good. Now take a look at this. So I have 4 of them left, right? So in here I'm going to say 4. Integer i set to 0, i less than 4, and i plus plus. And I'm going to do this, c out, pi, as if p is an array. What's going to hold me for that? Is it, aren't arrays pointers pointing to a chunk of memory? Now this P is pointing halfway through this array. So P is actually an array of four integers that is sharing the last four integers of A. Correct? So if I actually run this program, let me show you actually go step by step so we'll see. So when I run it, you'll see that it comes over here, definitely that's 30. But in here, this is P0, which is 30, then P1, 
which is 40, 50, 60, and it comes out. Okay? So, proof. That's perfect proof for it. But the diff what, is, so what is the difference between he and A in here? Yeah, so A is doomed to point to those six integers. But P can point anywhere. If I made that a constant integer pointer, then the story would have been different. I had to actually set it to, to that thing, and it would remain that. But yeah, Are we good? Are we good? 1% midterm. All right. And your, I think your half of your workshop is 1.5% of the whole thing. So, so, so cherish these things. It's, they come handy. Sometimes they, it makes your B plus an A, these bonus marks. So try to answer questions. You don't have to be perfectly right. As long as you're kind of right, you get these bonus marks. So we're good down to this point? Everything's OK? All right. So I want you to kind of digest what I just put over here. Here we go for a break. Come back in five minutes, five, 10 minutes. And we're going to get our first taste of dynamic memory allocation and see what is it good for. Okay, so when you come back, I'm going to propose, uh, I'm going to give you a problem and tr ask you to try and solve. And please try and solve it when we come. It's a very simple IPC 144 question. Okay, and I want you to tell me how, how we can do that so we can teach dynamic memory allocation properly. So we'll pause back in five, ten minutes. During break, I was asked to, if, like, what if over there I go in, in line number seven, I go to five. And it's going to print garbage. Yes, it's going to print garbage because you're going outside of the size of the array. You're actually going to some random memory and looking at them as integers and print them. Obviously, it's going to be all garbage. Is there a way to find out where is the end of the array? No. C, C++ is not capable of doing that. It is absolutely impossible in your program to know what the size of your array is. Okay? In the local scope there is, which is so bad, it's a bad practice, so I'm not going to even teach it to you. So in main, I can find out what its size of A is. But if I'm going to another function, then I have no idea. OK, that's that. This is the problem that I, am, uh, that I want to solve now. A client comes to you and asks you to write a very simple program. The program is to receive few integers and print them in reverse order. Why? Because he's paying you 50 bucks. Who cares? OK? You want to do it. He wants it. You get the money you're doing. So how do you approach this? How do we do this? That's beautiful. And so you go reverse. So you receive it first, and then you go backwards. You count how many times you are OK. So do you think you can write it? Doesn't matter. A. Int I what? Uh, what is the size of the array? Five, six. No, I have five million. Or maybe two. No. That's the problem. If I don't know how many integers, what are you going to do? Because I said few, few. We ask. We ask the user. User says 500. Then what do you do? You can't. An array has to be a constant value. When you create an array, the, the number of the, that, that is a compile time thing, which brings us to the, dis, the discussion. What is compile time and runtime? You know what is compile time? When you are at your computer typing and you compile. That's the time. There is no user. You compile. The executable is done. You're gone. You went back home, whatever. You give your executable to the user. User just executes your program, and your program is running. That is runtime. The size of the array is done in compile time. There is no user. When your program is running, how can you set the size of the array? And don't answer that question. <laughs> OK? That's where dynamic memory allocation comes in. You can, what you can do, you can actually postpone the size of your array to runtime. So instead of compiler, 
Remember when we were doing two seconds ago about integers, I said when you create an integer, the integer is inside your executable. So when I create an array of six integers over here, this array of six integers is inside your executable. And bravo, thank you very much for answering. Uh, uh, so these six integers are inside my executable. So if I make that a million, my executable will be a million multiplied by four bytes bigger because it's inside my executable. But when I do it in runtime, because now I know an array is nothing but a pointer and a piece of memory, I just create one pointer in my executable. I ask the user for how many integers. Then I ask the operating system, when the program is running, give me 500 integers. Your executable is fixed size in the memory. Operating system goes outside of the memory of your executable within the shared area of your computer, which we call heap. It goes to the heap and brings the things out of that place and gives you a distant location in memory, the address, and says, this is for you now while your program is running. So you get that address, you put it in P, as we did over here, and treat it like a regular array. And when you're done, at the end of the program, you give the memory back to the computer. But sometimes we forget doing that. And it happens so many times. Have you ever had a problem that your internet got disconnected? You called Rogers and say, okay, disconnect the modem, wait for 15 seconds, and put it back in? Their program did not delete the memories properly. Every time a connection is happening or something, it leaves some garbage in memory. So your memory is filled with garbage over and over and over and over until your modem doesn't have any space to run anymore. It hangs, no internet. You take it out, it gets rebooted, everything's gone, you put it back in, all the garbage is gone from memory, it starts from fresh, internet comes back for another two months until a firmware update comes and, and fixes it, yes. Pardon me? I think it's a stack question. I'll kill you. <laughs> okay, so what, what, why I kill him? I'm talking about, I'm saying, I'm trying to make the first carriage that is pulled with, with, with horses, and he says, could it go with a Formula One car? That's, yeah, so a stack is using dynamic memory allocation uh, in data structures three years from now. Anyway, so, so all right. So no, we, we can't use it for this one, and I'll explain why. But anyways, so what are we going to do? So let's actually write the program, and I'm going to show you what the syntax is. We go through it. We understand how it works and everything. Um, so when do we need to, now I think you know when do we need dynamic memory allocation, if you really think about it hard. Two cases. First, when you are writing your program, you don't know how much memory you want. That's number one. Numero uno, right? Numero dos. When the amount of memory you want is so big that your executable, it bloats your executable out of proportion. Because of that, you rather have that one outside and let it come from the shared piece of memory. So. Uh, your, pro your program loads and runs pretty fast. Are we okay with this? Okay, so let's do it. Now, I want to write a program that does that. So what I will do over here, I will say over here, C out. I'm gonna call it reverser, if that's the word. <laughs> okay, then I'm gonna say C out, enter the number of integers. All right. Now, in here, I need to know how many I have, so I'm going to put a CNT, a number, and this is a universal way of setting everything to its default, default value. Put an empty curly bracket in front of it, it means it will be defaulted. A default for a primitive value is always zero. So you put that one in front of anything, it makes it zero. Even if you put that one in front of an array, all the elements become zero. So you don't have to write a loop and set them to zero, okay? That's actually from C. It doesn't, it's not C++. But, but this is C++, a new, newer version of C++. And now, in here, I'm going to read it. So I'm going to say C in, into CNT, and I read the value. Now I need my pointer. So 
int pointer nums. Oh, come on. Nums. See, I'm going to set it, set it, set it that one to a null pointer. You can say equal to null PTR. And by the way, null for a pointer, null, uh, let, yeah, mm, a null value for a pointer in C++ is NPTR, null PTR. Null PTR essentially is a constant value that holds a, a zero address, a null address in it. You can use it for whenever you want to set something or check to see if a pointer is null or not. But you, I could have put a curly bracket because that's the universal way, but I wanted to teach null PDR. That's why I did it that way. Now that I got this one, now I know how many I want. So now I'm going to say nums is set to new. New is a call for operating system to give you new memory. So you tell to OS, I want new memory. Of what type? Integer. How many? CNT. Done. Ta-da. So now this is a dynamic thing. Why we say dynamic? Because it wasn't there when your program was running. It's actually your user that gives you how many things you want. To make sure you don't have memory leak, if possible, immediately delete it so you don't forget. And you delete the way you allocate. If you use score brackets for allocation, you use score brackets for delete. Soon I'm going to tell you what is the other alternative. So now at line 10, I may have an array of integers. Why may? Because maybe I don't have enough memory. And don't forget, maybe you want 100,000 integers. And you have 200,000 integers free memory. If it is not a contiguous series of integers in memory, it won't give you. Memory allocation only happens when it's continuously back to back in a sequence. So it cannot be like 50,000 in here and 50,000 in here. It has to be 100,000 back to back. Okay? If that fails, new sets nums to null pointer. So in here, before I want to do anything, I'm going to say if nums is equal to null PTR, not enough memory. Which brings us back to this scenario. So what if nums is, nums is null and you try to delete it? Inside delete, there is an if mechanism hard-coded. If it's null, it won't delete it. OK, so you can safely delete any pointer. If it has an address, it will delete. It Essentially, delete means give back to OS. OK, so here you are borrowing uh, memory. Here you are giving back. Borrow, give back. OK? Would have been nice, actually. We could actually do that. Go in a define statement and call new borrow and call delete give back. <laughs> we could do that, like the pointer thingy. Anyways, so not enough memory. And otherwise, then I can actually do my process in here. Now I have an integer of exactly CNT ints in it, an integer array with exactly CNT as length. So now I can say integer i for i set to 0 i less than cnt and i plus plus. And in here, I'm going to say uh, c out, enter the values or the numbers. Go to new line. And in here, show some kind of a prompt to enter the integers. And before the prompt, I can actually show the row number 2. So I'm going to put over here i plus 1 and show the row number and wait for the user to enter it. And user is going to enter nums i, which is essentially filling the array with the information that is coming in. And then we print it backwards over here. So uh, in here, I can, I'm going to say for i set to cnt minus 1 i greater than or equal to 0, and i minus minus. I'm going to separate. The reason that I 
The only reason that I say in reverse order was a trick, because if I would just tell you to print it back, you could simply, you know, one by one print it back or something like that. So I didn't want that. I want everybody to the old reading be done and then print, do some process. I could say like sorted or something. So it means you have to you have to have them all before you can do anything. <clears throat> so now in here I'm going to say C out and I'm going to put uh, nums i and I put a space after just to separate them and go to new line later. Okay, so doing something like this, oh, work like that's what. All right, so let's put this one over here. All right, so program runs. CNT had some garbage, now it's zero. NUMS has garbage, as you see, but as soon as it's done, it's zero. It's going to say reverser, then it's going to say enter number of integers and ask for how many. I'm not going to put 5,000 in here, I'm just going to put four. Oh, not there. I'm going to first run this and then put four over here. Okay, so now it says NUMS, which is null, will be address of new four integers in memory. And as soon as I do that, nums is now actually pointing to garbage. It's my garbage, but it's garbage. And unlike other things, you cannot treat it as an array. If it was an array, you could actually bring the thing over here. You could actually bring it over here and do like this, and it shows all the elements in the local scope. But in here, the compiler is not aware if this is one integer or five million. It's just an address. But I know how many, it's C and T of them. If nums is null, it's going to print not enough memory, which is not. Now it's going to say enter the numbers. So I'm going to come right down to here. One, I'm going to put 10, 20, 30, and 40, hit enter. So it's going to show them in reverse order, obviously. And then end it. And at the end, as you see, it's now pointing to 10. But as soon as I delete it, it becomes garbage. Because it's immediate. And there are so many processes happening in your computer that as soon as you give it back, it's overwritten by some other program somewhere immediately. So there is no guarantee that it remains the same. And we are done. So that's dynamic memory allocation, the beginning of dynamic memory allocation. And what I wanted to tell you is that you can allocate individual pieces of memory. In here, it's absolutely nuts to do so, but I'm going to do it just for the heck of syntax. Like allocating memory for a single integer is just stupid, because it is already four bytes. So I create a pointer of that, that actually size of four, and then allocate another four, so I'm losing memory. But I'm just doing it to show you, because you may have a structure, say, map is a structure that has hundreds of thousands of vectors in it. And you want that thing, an instance of it. You may want to make it dynamic. One instance of a map is worth it. But one instance of an integer, eh, OK. So in here, if I wanted this thing to be dynamic, obviously I will make it a pointer. And I'm going to make it null. And I'm going to say same, same as below, but with curly brackets. So it sets to null. It doesn't make any difference. Line number four and num number five are the same. Now, before I get the CNT, I'm going to allocate memory for it. So now here, I'm going to say CNT is equal to new int and nothing else. One integer. So essentially, CNT is an array of one integer, <laughs> which is kind of funny. So you can actually go CNT 0 if you want to. But you CNT 1 is going to crash your program. OK? So CNT, either you can actually, either you can go target of CNT, which actually becomes the 1, or you go CNT 0, potatoes, potatoes. They are the same. OK? So that's that one. And after everything is done, in here, I'm going to put target of CNT again. 
and target of CNT again. Actually, let me put this one. Just, I'm just putting different variations so you remember what, what it means. They are exactly the same. But when I'm deleting them, because CNT is only one, the delete must be done like this. No uh, square brackets. Delete the way the way you allocate, which means new. Not new, it's new. Okay, so <clears throat> in here, because I allocated it without square bracket, I delete it without square bracket. Now, what happens if I forget this, for example, over here? It's not going to give me an error, but the difference would be that it only gives the first element back to operating system. The rest of the array will remain in memory, and it's going to stay forever until you restart your computer. Like you, uh, yeah, so programs that has lots of leak like this, actually cripples your computer because your computer keeps losing memory that nobody accesses, and then it's done. Obviously, when you are doing it under an IDE like uh, Visual Studio, it has its own simulated heap in there, which means when you are actually allocating memory under debugger, and you see over here it's in debug mode, okay, that actually uses its own internal memory. So if you have memory leak, nothing happens. You close Visual Studio, everything's got back to normal. You don't have memory leak. But if that thing comes out of the debug and goes to production, goes to release, it means now it's going to actually use computer's memory. You are not in a protected bubble anymore. Okay? That's one of the good things about IDEs. When you develop in them, you have a, a safe sandbox to play in, and you're not going to make anything dirty. Okay? And that was the introduction to dynamic memory allocation. And uh, I'm going to go through lots of good stuff after. Um, we have nothing else to talk about today. That was the introduction. So when <laughs> workshop two comes up, you're going to see it's going to be dynamic uh, uh, arrays of structures. So you have a structure, and you create uh, an array of structures, but dynamically. It doesn't make any difference. Integer, employee, car. Whatever you want, you can create a, a dynamic memory of it and delete it. I'm going to talk about the next day we are coming in. That is our lecture. I'm going to actually bring, I have like six, seven slides on dynamic memory allocation tips and tricks. But I want these things to settle in first. So go home, do some practice, play a little bit with it. Don't just allocate integers. Create an area of structures and do it that way. And next time you come back in, well, actually, I'm going to actually bring up slides and tell you exactly what you need to be careful about when you are doing this. C++ is one of the most powerful languages in the world. It's because memory allocation is in your hands. Why you don't see any decent games written in, for example, Java? Because Java has garbage collection. In Java, you only do new. You don't have a delete. Because it doesn't trust you. It thinks you're going to have a uh, memory leak. It says, whenever the time is good, I'm going to delete it myself. The problem is that time is good is decided by your Java virtual machine, which means you are writing a game, and the character is running, and suddenly it decides to delete all the memory, and boop, it pauses, and then goes again. OK? So it's not in your hand. But in C++, you have the power to delete it when you want and when you think it's the best time for it. Problem is that? so often you shoot yourself in the foot, forgetting to actually delete. So your program will have memory leaks. Again, with power comes responsibility. It's always that way. There is no uh, way to sugarcoat it. OK? Also, what I wanted to say, yeah, and, and, and as we go further in C++, C++ 17, C++ 20, you will see that there are mechanisms designed that makes this safe. We're going to have things called smart pointers and things like that that we're going to learn. And these smart pointers and stuff uh, kind of delete their own memory. You don't need to delete it, so they are safe. So we'll come to those things in OP345. So in 345, when you're read, studying all these things, you'll see we are very much uh, out of the syntax of C++ of, and we go into science of it, which is pretty cool. Uh, any questions? Suggestions? Objections? 
and the rest is lap of whatever. So I'm going to pause this for 10 minutes to explain. When you are actually <coughs> deleting, please uh, appreciate that. Delete has target of in its belly. When you are deleting nums, okay, you are deleting the target of nums. It has nothing to do with nums itself. Nums is a local variable, an integer that you defined in main, and when main is over, it automatically goes, is going to go away because the scope is over. But where num is pointing to is your responsibility. So you don't, because they would say, why we are not writing delete target of CNT? Why don't we write delete star CNT? Because you are not deleting CNT, because that target of is within the belly of, of new. New knows that it only deals with the target of. You don't need to worry about that. Okay? Um, any questions? <laughs>